Welcome to This Week in Hearing. I'm Heather Maliuk, and today I have with me Dr. Kathleen Wallace and Dr. Laura Sinnott. We are all audiologists who work part-time with Tuned, a new teleaudiology platform. Tuned was designed to give access to true audiologic expertise and care to those who otherwise might not seek it out or who are perhaps looking for a non-traditional approach. Through the Tuned approach, we're really aiming to empower audiologists to lean into their knowledge and expertise to demonstrate their value to patients without a sale attached. And in a bit, we'll discuss what Tuned isn't, but the real purpose of today's podcast is to provide listeners with a chance to peek behind the curtain and see what three clinical audiologists have learned while helping develop such a platform. We all have unique experiences and backgrounds which have informed this process, and I'd love to offer any listeners the opportunity to hear the ups and downs, the surprises, and of course, the letdowns of creating a modern teleaudiology platform with as much transparency as we can give. So to start, I mentioned that my name's Heather Maliuk. I'm a clinical and research audiologist. I've been in the field 10 years, and I own Soundcheck Audiology. Um, I like a lot of aspects of audiology. I work a lot in hearing conservation as it relates to musicians, and I really love telehealth. It, it allows me to connect with new people as well as my own patients, no matter where they are in the world. Um, so that's a little bit about me. My role at Tuned is head of audiology. I've been with Tuned for about two years. We're all part-time here. Um, and I've really appreciated the chance again, to see behind the scenes at how a company like this is developed and how to look at different studies, look at the evidence, look at devices, et cetera, and kind of oversee everything. Um, Laura, would you mind giving your background and what you're doing at Tuned? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Laura Sinnott, and I've <clears throat> I've been an audiologist for about five years only. A career expanded in my mid-30s. Previously, I was an audio engineer, or well, still am an audio engineer, working in the film industry. And what I do at Tuned is mostly focus on vetting devices. And you'll learn about this later, but one of the cool things about Tuned is we connect audiologists and provide education and knowledge about non-traditional hearing aids we we embrace hearing aids too but we also know that there are a plethora of devices out there in the consumer world and some of them are pretty freaking awesome um, and this is coming from the audio engineering side of me as well as the audiologist so i vet the products i run objective measurements on them subjective measurements and then i kind of condense um, or I edit the information and try to present it in a way that helps uh, audiologists figure out what devices are good enough um, to recommend to certain people. And then on the audi audiology side, I also very recently started a com company called Sound Culture, which I have to give Heather props for naming my company. Um, and it's just getting off the ground, but I'm focusing on concierge audiology. I see orchestras and I see musicians mostly at this time. Awesome. Thanks, Laura. Kathleen. Hi, everyone. I'm Kathleen Wallace. I'm an audiologist here in New York City. Uh, with Tuned, I am the um, head of provider education, so I oversee a branch of um, what we call Tune University, and we will get into more detail there, but it's essentially the resource hub for audiologists on the Tune platform. A lot of uh, continuing education, essentially, and thought pieces, and uh, just questioning the standard care of audiology. Um, my experience up until this point has been um, in traditional medical models in ENT clinics or hospitals. Um, so this is certainly a change of pace from that. Um, and in addition, I'm also an adjunct professor at the CUNY Graduate Center, uh, which is my alma mater and Laura's alma mater. Um, and what interests me in audiology is I love to analyze um, the profession of audiology itself and how to moder modernize it um, how to improve audiology education and um, how to promote hearing health care and patient education. Awesome. Yeah. And for anyone listening, um, if you don't, uh, if you're not connected with Kathleen on LinkedIn, that's a great place to see a lot of articles that are put out about this as well as some thoughts and really good conversations. I always enjoy following your posts, Kathleen. Um, as a means to start, I, you know, I started with Tune two years ago little over two years ago. And one of the things that struck me was this concept of brand agnosticism. 
and not having influence from the manufacturing side of things. And I really took to that right away. I thought it was really important because so often in the audiologic world, we see sort of the big manufacturers kind of owning the scene in a way. They don't own the whole scene, you know, but there's, there's a big influence there. And I decided when I started that I really, really wanted to maintain this brand agnosticism with Tuned. And I find that a lot of audiologists are surprised when they hear that we aren't a pay to play platform. You know, they get on the site and they see a product and they assume someone has paid to be there. That's not the case. They're there because myself or Laura or Kathleen has talked to that company. We've tried something out. We've decided there's a good reason for them to be there. The other thing is, I really wanted a space for audiologists to practice without having to focus on product sales. You know, I wanted a space where the audiologists could be elevated above that, where they could be separated from the device and really be seen for their brains and their knowledge and their expertise. There is a statistic that 24 million people see an audiologist every year. So they're seeking out some kind of care, many different reasons. But within that statistic, 81% of those potential patients leave the clinic without a solution, without a care component. Maybe they need a device, maybe they don't. And I think a lot of these individuals I'm seeing who have normal or mild hearing profiles, mild hearing loss are sort of left on the clinic floor. Um, And so, you know, being able to present them with more options to not be tied to a certain manufacturer device or not even be tied to a device at all. Like I said, some people don't need a device. They need an audiologist. Um, so this was really important to me. And I, you know, Kathleen, I'd love to know your thoughts on this aspect of what we do. Yeah, I, I think the brand agnosticism is is crucial for the success of Tuned. And um, it's strange how this is sort of a um, an exception to the rule that the standard uh, default is people are expecting there to be some relationship or role of um, industry. Um, and I love that we're, we're not that. And absolutely the part about using your whole brain that you said, I am a huge endorser of. Um, all of us did not go to school for as long as we did to just become glorified hearing instrument specialists or, um, you know, pick certain specialties and then not go beyond that. So I think it's really important for patient trust um, to have that independence. Um, and then I also have sort of shifted my thinking personally um, with Tuned is um, of viewing myself more as a hearing and communication consultant, um, where I am just your resource. I will share all of my knowledge and educate you as much as you can and empower you to be an informed consumer for you to use that information however you see fit, whether it's a device or auditory training or tin disc management, whatever it is. Um, and I think that's a really exciting area of audiology and something that Tuned actually absolutely enables and promotes. Yeah, the collaboration is really essential. And um, Laura, I'd love to know your thoughts before I move on to the next topic, just what, what you've seen really with this not being tied to a device or a manufacturer and how that's how you're working with that on the platform. Yeah, I think, I mean, honestly, having recently been a student, again, I think five years or so, when you're a student, you're you're becoming an expert because you're diving in so deeply into all of this knowledge and education. And then little by little, it's like, oh, wait, <laughs> we have to sell things. And I remember one textbook, or maybe it was a professor, they said, um, they said, ENTs are you know, medical ear doctors, but audiologists are experts in hearing. You know more than uh, than ENTs do about hearing. And that just uh, sort of a light bulb went off because I'm like, oh, it's true. Like nobody owns hearing better than audiologists. We are experts. But I think that we lose that over the years of practicing clinically because of so much pressure to sell devices that a lot of times we don't even feel the, the patient might need. Um, so yes, Tune just seems like this ideal, almost dream come true company, um, where we can go back to being the experts. And I think about for a lot of people that's intimidating because we're not used to practicing like that because we all, besides, um, focusing on this device sales, we also really focus on the audiogram, right? It's like, 
there's certain thing we always do with patients and without those kind of two things to fall back on. And we'll talk about the screeners that we have attuned in a moment, but you know, we don't have the traditional peritone audiogram with an audiometer. So sometimes people can feel like, oh, well, wait, what do I do? But we are, we're the experts. We just yeah. have to kind of like find that in ourselves again. Yeah, I agree. And looking beyond, again, looking beyond hearing loss, looking at the patients who need us for conservation, general education. Um, Kathleen, one of your specialties is third party disability, looking at like the whole family, how hearing loss impacts others. There's, there's so much more. And Lori, you said something that is always on my mind, which is the hearing testing. I, I love to ask students. I asked a student who was with me today in the clinic, why do we test hearing? What's the first thing you do when you see a patient? Why do you do it that way? Um, and I think uh, uh, the safe zone <laughs> for many audiologists is behind an audiometer. Like that's where they feel very comfortable. And one of the things that we did when looking at, you know, what do we need on the tuned platform and what do we not need? One of the big things was the hearing screener. <clears throat> Part of that was for the way we designed it was for the comfort of the audiologist. Uh, and what was interesting going into this I had not had that much experience with looking into the actual companies who produce these things and talking to them and trying to talk to the engineers. And uh, to be totally transparent here, I, I'm not going to say names uh, of any companies, but so many are not validated. And when we were trying to choose something, um, speaking to several of these companies and being on a meeting with them over Zoom or Google Meets or whatever and saying, Hey, can you send me some of your data? I, you know, I want to see comparisons with boot with in booth testing. I, I want to know more about your validation process. And several said, Oh, we didn't do anything. Like, I don't have anything to send you. Is that something that's necessary? And these are tests that I'm seeing on other clinicians' websites that I'm seeing used on websites of certain manufacturers. Um, and nothing was done in the process. So, you know, that's just something transparency wise, I think audiologists should know they're not all validated. And even when they are, there are differences still in transducers. There's a reason why they will probably, maybe always, maybe not always, but they're called screeners for a reason. <laughs> so, you know, and I, I do want to get more into that in a moment, Laura, but I just want to say, you know, what we looked at was, okay, can we just have one type of screening? And the answer was no, it's not enough. When someone walks into the clinic, I, I, unless it's just, you know, like an OSHA regulated hearing test where I'm just doing pure tones at certain frequencies. I do a lot more than that. And I know you guys do as well as, as does every other audiologist. So we start with a questionnaire, um, the CEDRA questionnaire, which is the consumer ear disease risk assessment tool, which was validated through otolaryngology world, looking for medical red flags to see, does the patient need to see an ear, nose and throat physician? Are there medical issues here that need to be addressed? And then we go into a digits and noise test. And then we thought we can't stop there. <laughs> we do a threshold test. And the reason for that, I, I've had a question from audiologists of why do we have two different types of tests? In my mind, it was looking at sort of like a cross validation. And I know it's not exactly the same, but I thought, well, in the clinic, we do a test and then we do SRT. There's usually something else. We're looking for things to line up. We're looking for reliability. And so I wanted something similar to that. Um, and so that's really where we started. And then Laura, you came on board and I'm curious to know your thoughts. I think you were not as surprised as me about the lack of validation because you had been looking into this for longer. Well, I think I wasn't surprised because um, it's hard to validate because of all the calibration yeah. issues. And, you know, talking about, you said something earlier, Heather, this is an example of how our podcast today, we're, we're all about transparency. One of the reasons we have a pure tone screener is because it will make audiologists comfortable. Um, right. They're not, they're not the end all be all, even the one that we have, which is I mean, it is one of the most validated screeners out there because we have we have looked at them all. It's still a pure tone screener and it is incredibly difficult, if not impossible, to get the same results on a pure tone screener if it's web based um, every single time. Mm -hmm. But I think this is another really good example because we have the digits and noise, we have the questionnaire, we have the pure tone screener, the pure tone threshold screener, I should say. Um, and we're gonna, we help you understand how to, or the audiologist, how to un, to interpret them, but you still have to, you know, put your thinking Stuff your brain. on. Yeah. <laughs> and make some judgments about the combination of results. So yeah, I think the, the digits and noise is a great kind of cross check for the pure tone threshold screener, because 
the um, threshold whether somebody passes or doesn't pass is based off of a free frequency pure tone average, I think. If it's 40 dB. It's um, a moderate oh, cop right, cutoff, yeah. Glass. So yeah. again, we help you understand those things. But yeah, um, I should also say, we tried to develop our own pure tone threshold screener attuned. And that's when I came on board about a year ago. Mm -hmm. And whether people liked it or not, I was, I feel like I was the squeaky wheel. I was like, you guys, there's a lot wrong with this. And we were trying to get it validated. We put lots of blood, sweat and tears, or I know that we did, even though I came on later and we dropped it because it wasn't good enough. Well, and so. I think that's why it's really important to point out that clinical audiologists are needed in the development of these things. That's the other thing that has surprised me about a lot of companies. We've got engineers, we've got MDs, this and that. And they're creating tools and not consulting with audiologists. And when when you and uh, look at something, or I do, or Kathleen, and we say, "Hang on a second, this is not good. We can't use this with a patient. This is not good enough." Someone has to say that. You know, that's the only that way to move tuned. the field forward. Well, exactly, yeah. exactly. And so um, nobody argued it. Every and that's why I think that was the first month I was there. Mm -hmm. And basically, like Danny, the co-founder, and and everybody else, they were like, you know what? You're, this this isn't good enough. Let's find right. something that is. Well, because at the end of that. the day, if it doesn't serve the patient, what's the point? Right. You know, that just doesn't make sense. So, so yeah, so the, the whole hearing screening process and what was created was a big eye opener. I'm happy with where we are now. And, and what I'm really excited about is looking into the future of this and seeing it. I do believe this will get better. And there are other things people can do, you know, like after the screener, if there is a red flag, well, guess what? That person might need to be seen in person. <laughs> you know, that is where you refer, or maybe they get an at-home test kit. You know, it doesn't stop there. You say, oh, something looks wonky on the screen or, oh, sorry, we can't do anything. That's not the case at all. Then you say, okay, you need to come see me in the clinic or let me help you find someone who's near you. Um, so really the screening is, is to look for issues. The other thing is, and Laura, you can probably talk about this a little bit in terms of devices. A lot of the newer devices that are used for mild hearing loss have a hearing test integrated that have to do with those transducers. So on a screening online, if you can get an idea of fitting range, and again, any medical issues, anything like that, the, that person will be taking another screening over the device that was meant for the transducers they have on, correct? Yeah, for most of the devices, yes. And a lot of them are using the Mimi hearing test, which I think a lot mm -hmm. of audiologists are familiar with. And that's just an example of how I think it's really great that the consumer world is getting involved because the Mimi hearing test is a super threshold screener um, or test. I have to, is it a test or a screener? Well, I, I think it's a screener. A screener. Um, I would call it a screener. But it's super threshold. So it's, it's just cool. It's like there are ways we can modernize audiology, but no one seems to have the resources to do it. So now consumer Correct. companies are coming in and that is one of the great benefits of, of those other industries getting involved. So that's very exciting to me. And I'm sure 10 years down the road, maybe 20, we're gonna have some amazing web-based diagnostic tools because companies are trying to figure it out. There's no question about it. Yeah. Um, and, oh, one last thing about that. Yes, most of these consumer devices do, but I should just mention the Bose sound control hearing aids. Mm -hmm. uh, which I think are going to be, they're, they're under the umbrella of Lexi now. Yes. But they don't actually require a hearing test. And I have spent hours vetting that, that device, objective measurements. I've had people try them who have hearing loss. Um, it is an amazing device and it doesn't even require a hearing test. So, and there's lots of validation behind it. I could get into it now, but I won't. <laughs> we only have so much time, but this is stuff this I, I will point out as we go into kind of the next topic I wanted to talk about focusing on the audiologists in, in terms of empowering them, educating them, et cetera. Um, I think that what you just raised is a good point. Who has time? Just quite frankly, who has time to do everything you're doing with all these devices? And that's one of the things we're trying to do here is provide resources to lift all audiologists up. We have about 130 on the platform right now, and we're continuing to grow. And um, the idea here is that everyone becomes an expert because we're providing the resources needed. So there's no hierarchy, there's no elitism. It's just, hey, we're taking the time to do this to help you diversify and expand your clinic. Um, and Kathleen, I kind of want to pull you back in here. Can you talk about the focus on audiologists 
why that's so important and how it relates to education and things like that? Yeah, and uh, I think what you both were just discussing about the the creation of our screening and um, how critical we have been and um, really being very cautious, um, everything that we do, it's very obvious that there are audiologists behind the scene, like that we are very much, we're towing the line of modernization along with being very rooted in best practices and evidence-based practice and, and making sure that we are making uh, very informed decisions about what we implement and how we are counseling people on it. And so there is a lot of provider education there, um, which is where Two University comes in. It's essentially our resource hub of um, everything you need to use the Tuned platform itself to conduct um, virtual appointments, um, how to interpret the screener, um, and along with how to how to um, approach the devices and really make sure that you're understanding and you feel comfortable with the recommendations you are making. There is a lot of resources going in and a lot of effort, um, to be honest, a, a whole lot of manpower going in to really producing very digestible resources for audiologists um, because we want to do right by our patient. And part of that is that we have to be well-informed and really own this expertise and a lot of people that maybe have been practicing a fraction of our scope of practice have interest in expanding, but they don't have the opportunities to do so. And two university is a great place for people to sort of dip their toe into learning from other professionals that might have different specialties, you know, audiologists with different specialties or knowledge base. Like I've learned a ton from both of you uh, with working together. And um, two university really fosters that collaborative um, environment and really learning from each other. Um, so we ultimately do right by our patient and everything is above board and audiologists are comfortable with it. Yeah. And the other thing is, uh, you know, we, the education I think is really important because again, the focus on is on keeping the audiologist independent. And uh, again, a question that I often get from audiologists when they're looking at tuned or joining is, am I employed by tuned? And whose patients are they? And the answer is no. And they're your patients. So the education is important because you are not just some cog in a wheel working for an employer being told to do things a certain way. The idea is that every audiologist is independent, has their own thoughts, has every patient they have is their patient. Um, tuned is a benefit for employers. So employees can get on the website, be connected with an audiologist in their state and get care. Um, that's, that's their patient. And so the idea of the education, Kathleen, what you're curating with university is that there's no need for them to not be confident with patients mm -hmm. that they're maybe not used to seeing because tuned is not in charge. <laughs> tuned is yeah. not in charge of their clinic. We are here to handhold a little bit, you know, we've given guides and, you know, things like that, but the idea is that they learn enough that they enter that, uh, meeting with their own knowledge, their own confidence, and they raise the bar for themselves and their colleagues. Yeah. And that, and that's the beauty of tuned is that you can use it however you want. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's your patients and you're the provider, you're it's your appointment. So you can conduct it however you want. We're just giving you all of the tools and, and empowering you to maybe diversify a little bit or serve, make sure you're serving those patients as best you can with the more modern approach to audiology, because a lot has changed since we all graduated from our AUD programs. And it's very hard to find the kind of resources that we've been making, if, whether it's, you know, comparing Bluetooth stethoscopes or tinnitus apps or Laura doing very detailed um, vetting videos of these devices at, where you can actually hear the samples. You're not getting this anywhere else, but it's crucial information for audiologists to feel comfortable with the care they're providing. Yeah. I mean, on to university today, I put up some resources I read on EMF radiation and AirPods, because I've had questions from patients who are young, you know, people who, again, maybe wouldn't walk into an audiology office, but they're going to have a screening and a wellness appointment because it's through their employer. And they're asking these kind of questions and saying, well, the audiologist should know this is something that goes in my ears. And I'm like, oh gosh, I don't, I don't know. I need to read about that. So yeah, there's, there's a lot going into this new era, I think of, of hearing care where uh, there's just so much to learn. And especially with the products and Laura, just to, 
I want to get an idea from you, I guess, in your words, because you're doing this all the time, reviewing products. Why is this important? I mean, I have my idea of why it's important, but why do you think it's important? And then can you give sort of a brief synopsis of like, what's your process basically with a product? Sure. I'm, I'm going to do something that is hypocritical because I, I really value the act of listening. And there are lots of people who are in the wisdom practices world who will tell you like when you're actively listening or you're having a conversation, most people aren't listening. They're thinking about the thing they're going to say next. Um, and I was totally just doing that with you, Heather, because, um, (laughs) We were, we were talking about when, oh, when you mentioned young people. So yeah. n- right now, uh, you know, if we're going to, I'm in this mood of God tuned is amazing. Like, hallelujah. <laughs> so something last week, I think at our audiology meeting, we learned about um, how much we're, we're put tuned is putting a lot of money into marketing mm-hmm. and advertising. And really what's so cool is that it's helping to elevate and build awareness for hearing. So we always talk about in audiology, how audiologists don't do a really good job about advertising our own profession compared to dentists. And that's why one one reason why society at large doesn't value their hearing because nobody's telling them that they should value their hearing. So again, it's just like another plug for why I loved Tuned so much because, you know, we're spending our own money, but really it's it's to try to also get these young people to come and see audiologists because yeah. we know it's important. And again, serving people who don't necessarily near, need hearing aids, but they need hearing health care. So yeah, yeah. Which I want to get to uh, into in a minute because I want to talk about some like the types of patients we're seeing and yeah. So you know how how that's working, but do you want me to still of, talk about the device? Well, thing? I do, I do, but I want to preface it by saying like if you're If you're an audiologist listening to this and you're thinking, okay, all I've heard is that like products are, are bad. Like anything that's not a hearing aid is bad. And the other thing is what an overwhelming, um, thing to get into, because if you try to search any kind of earpiece or headphone or whatever, even on Amazon, you're going to come up with so many options. And again, who has the time to sift through these? And so I know that you are sifting through them which is why I want you to talk about your process. And part of why I want you to talk about your process is this is not a proprietary thing. This is something anyone can do in their clinic if they have the resources. This is not a secret. It's just, it takes a long time. So so why do you think it's important and, and how are you going about it and how how is it helping clinicians? Sure, and, and you're absolutely right, Heather. And for those really nerdy people out there like myself, if you have, if you want to do a re- review, post it to Tuniversity. We would love that. We love it. I would say that um, you can definitely, I can definitely judge. I think we all could, to a certain degree, just off of a company's website, if they're worth trying to even get the device in your hands and in your ears and listen to it. Um, if they have zero specs or if they don't have many specs on the device, if there doesn't seem to be any company history, all of those things. So for devices that do sound compelling and interesting, once we do get them in our hands, my process is I really try not to watch other people's reviews because I try to remain as unbiased as possible. I will try to learn about the company. I will try to see if there's published research. And for some devices there are, for some there are not. So I'll do my own background and research on it, but without watching reviews. And then I typically perform first, I I just subjectively listen to it. And I have a minimum of uh, 10 hours. I I need to listen at least for 10 hours in different situations. And then I will run the objective measurements Uh, that might be Verifit 2 or using my audio engineering tools to do so because some of the devices, you can't use the Verifit 2 with it. And we make recordings, binaural recordings of most of the devices. And that is very cool because, again, you can listen to samples of how they sound. They're not, you know, perfect Keymar laboratory types of assessments, but they give you somewhat of an idea, which is really nice. And sometimes I use those recordings to help me make objective analyses on the devices. Um, And then once I have all of that information, I start scripting together a tutorial that's geared towards audiologists. And that is another process of deciding what's the most important information. Because in the beginning, I wanted to put all the information in there. And then I'm like, wait, Laura, (laughs) these are audiologists. Nobody has time. 
I'll be lucky if they actually even watch half of the video. Um, so yeah, it's deciding what is the most important information and then we produce the video and that's a whole other story, but um, it's a lot of work. And yeah, I, know, I, work. I like the way you do some of the things like I, there's a video on to university of you doing a cartwheel in a set of devices <laughs> to see if you'll stay in your ears. I mean, well, these the are, <laughs> and it's funny because these are things that patients might ask about, you right. know, and it's like, yeah. okay, well, every audiologist doesn't have time to try every device, but mm -hmm. we do have something called listening club, which Kathleen, this is in your area as well. I don't know if you want to describe it, but where they can listen to any product that we have listed, they can rent it, correct? Yeah. So this is a very nice um, supplement to what Laura offers. You know, Laura does the technical detail of, you know, the objective measurements along with some subjective uh, feedback. And then um, ultimately audiologists need to feel comfortable with actually, you know, holding and uh, feeling and feeling it in their ears and, and hearing it. And what does it sound like in different settings, these different devices that none of us have ever had exposure to like before I got involved with tuned, I had never had hands-on experience with any devices other than hearing aids or, you know, cochlear implants or Bajas. Um, so it is a very unknown realm. So how are they supposed to get comfortable with recommending it if they have never even tried it themselves? So we have, um, listening club, it's uh, available to all audiologists on the Tune platform. It's in partnership with Otree Products. Um, and it's essentially a device rental library where we have partnerships with all these uh, manufacturers with the purpose of audiologists getting their hands on these devices um, so you can vet it yourself. And then we're going to um, sort of uh, gather all of that feedback so we have subjective measurements and um, rankings and ratings along with what Laura is offering from the technical side. Yeah, I think it's really helpful to do it that way. So it's not just, so it's sort of like a community effort. And I think that's nice. And, you know, to just say about devices, audiologists do tend to be device focused, right? But uh, I, I know a lot of the people I'm seeing on the platform don't really need a new device. Maybe they have something and they just need to learn how to use it properly, or um, perhaps it's something else. So we've brought up APD a couple of times. We've, you know, tinnitus, things like that. There are also things being looked at different apps. For example, there, we have a couple of webinars with app creators um, looking at tinnitus apps. We're about to roll out a pediatric department, you know, looking at, can we, can we start finding kids who maybe are not being found through school screenings or whatever? Um, and so there's, a, again, there's a lot more to this than someone with hearing loss being seen for a device fitting. And, and I think that's the other thing to point out here is looking at this holistically. Um, so speaking of people's needs, I, I kind of wanted to mention who I'm seeing over tuned because I find that when I speak to sort of a classic or traditional audiologist, they, they might not be aware of, of like who telehealth is actually reaching the average age groups I'm seeing are between 22. And I think the I'm trying to think of the age span here, where, how high I've gone up mid fifties, maybe you know, and again, people who are maybe working from home and they don't necessarily want to walk into an audio, excuse me, audiology office, or they feel like they don't have time. Um, they basically want a wellness check. They want to learn how to use earpieces safely. I've seen people over the platform who are using earpieces eight to 10 hours a day on calls. And then on top of that, they're exercising for an hour with them and they have something in their ears all day. And they want to know about safe listening levels, you know, and I teach them about things like binaural summation and how to choose what's appropriate for them, or maybe using something during meetings. If they, if they do need a little boost, something like a sonic cloud app or, uh, you know, whatever. And it's really cool <laughs> to see these people learn about their hearing and get really excited and say, oh my gosh, I can't believe I haven't seen an audiologist before. Um, so that's, you know, from the patient side, it's really, really cool to see this demographic. We know there's like 700 million ears in our country. <laughs> there's only 11,000 odd full-time audiologists. And so many are focused on moderate to severe hearing loss. Um, and, and we're, we're missing out. We're missing out on really good relationships with people who, who need us. So, so that's what I'm seeing from the patient side. Um, I was curious what you guys are seeing in terms of the audiologist side. 
what you think about who we're seeing join Tuned. I think that um, the conversations that I've had or what I've seen of people signing up on on Tuned, um, people are falling into a couple of different buckets. And it's pretty interesting, the the different kinds of use cases, because again, at Tuned, you can use however you want to use it. It's not the greatest analogy, but um, I have compared it before to like Etsy, you know, you're, you're running your business through <laughs> Tuned. You can do whatever you want with it. It could be whatever kind of story you want it to be. So we have people that are well-established in private practice and they just want to open up a virtual branch of their practice. Um, and maybe they're using it with their current ba- uh, patients or expanding to their whole state. Um, the next category, I think we're seeing people that are doing this more as like a night owl kind of gig of it's a side job to supplement what their full-time job is. Maybe they're not full fulfilled with what they're doing during the day, or they want to just like diversify and keep their options open. Uh, and then lastly, we're seeing people that are actually starting uh, fully virtual clinics through Tuned, which is super cool. And because it is a turnkey solution, it's the whole infrastructure. Um, but in general, I would say people within the first 10 years of their of their practice is probably the bulk of it. Um, people that move often, that don't want to be held to an office job, that maybe are burnt out after COVID. We're seeing a lot of different trends pop up, which is um, which is great. I think this is this having another kind of audiology, a way to practice audiology. It, it just makes sense for people. Their lives changed after COVID. And this mm-hmm. meets a lot of audiologists where they're at, too. It's not just a patient-centered approach. It's also sort of a provider-centered uh, platform. Yeah. And what's really cool about this is I've never worked in a situation where I've gotten to meet so many audiologists. And I really love our field because there are everyone's really passionate about what they do. And they're burnout for whatever reason. And see this as an aspect of freedom or something new to learn, which is really fun. Um, but everyone's really passionate about hearing healthcare, which has been, it's been a real joy to see. Um, as we wrap this up, the last thing I wanted to ask as a question for us are what are our biggest challenges right now? Challenges right now in our field and what we're doing. Um, and what we're seeing with audiologists and just to start, you know, seeing this patient base and audiologists saying, well, how do I access them? You know, audiologists want new patients. Um, they want net new, they want to see more people. They want to reach more people and help more people. So that would be first. And, you know, maybe they're not sure where to find them and then, you know, kind of marketing and how to, how to go about that. I know with me, I, of course I've had my clinic for a number of years now. Um, and this wasn't too big of a stretch for me to start doing. And I think that's one of the reasons why I was asked to be head of audiology, because I've been working in this kind of URL, IRL fashion for quite some time, really, I think like since 2016. And it's not new in audiology. We've got people who've been working in telehealth since the 90s. Like this is not a new thing. But I think the patient population is sort of new. Um, uh, So, you know, in terms of what, how those people are accessed with Tuned. And I mentioned about it being a, a benefit you know, through employers. Um, but then I'm also curious about, you know, both of you with, with what you're doing, like Laura with your clinic or Kathleen with, you know, you, you wear several hats in your audiology life, how you're going about marketing or seeing patients in this way. What I wanted to say as well is tuned. The other cool thing, I, we're at a meeting the other day and I think it was Danny again, who or might've been Kate, the other co-founder, but they said something like tuned we are you know we're serving patients obviously we're also serving audiologists and we're also serving these employers like these companies that we're signing contracts with that have tens of thousands of employees that will now have a benefit of speaking with an audiologist mm-hmm. and again that is just something that is so and, and the people in tune you know there's a whole group of people who work with tuned other than the three of us right and their roles are so diverse it i've worked in startups before but not in this kind of capacity and the the talent that is behind getting these contracts and and essentially selling hearing the importance of hearing health to these big companies that we're we're partnering with that's just so exciting 
So the, the challenge I would say, and this is more of a personal challenge I can take myself outside of tuned and as somebody who's just started their own baby private practice. Um, yeah, like how are, how are we, how are we going to make money? How are we going to see patients over the platform? How do we convince people it's worth spending the money to have a session with us over the computer? Mm -hmm. And tuned is doing amazing work to communicate the importance of that to kind of society at large, but mm -hmm. then we have to do that individually as well. And yeah, it's challenging. That's always challenging. But mm -hmm. again, we, we do provide resources to try to help that. Um, I think that Kathleen, maybe you can talk about your SEO experiments that you're, you're doing, but yeah, that's, it's challenging, but it's, it's, it's happening slowly for me as a new private practice owner. Yeah. I think, um, something to point out that maybe we didn't mention is there's an hourly rate that the clinician sets. So like whatever your hourly rate is, that's what you set on the platform, whatever you want it to be. And we do provide a direct referral link. So I mentioned earlier that when someone gets on the platform, they see audiologists in their state. Well, say you're emailing with someone and they're asking you questions and you've done enough emailing back and forth and you say, okay, you can schedule a consultation with me. I, I do that quite often. Uh, and I send them my tuned link so that rather than seeing every audiologist in Ohio, they go straight to me. So that's the other thing people might be wondering, well, how, like, how would someone get to me, <laughs> you know, through this platform, there's, there's a link for that where they can get directly to you. And, um, I think with something like with a hybrid approach to working one job and then, you know, doing the moonlighting and, and, and things like that, I'm seeing some really cool things, some really creative marketing come out of that with some of the audiologists we're working with. And Kathleen, I know that you work really closely with some of the audiologists, but seeing the cool social media posts and people's websites. And um, I know we were talking about this earlier with a couple of the audiologists, I won't name names, but just how creative they're getting. And um, have you been particularly impressed or has something left a lasting impression on you in terms of the marketing scene we're, we're finding? Yeah, I, I, I think, um, Laura, back to what you were saying, the, the marketing and the messaging has been surprising. And we know this about audiology, that conveying the importance of hearing healthcare has always plagued audiology and its, you know, progress forward. And that is absolutely true. It's been more complicated than I expected to accurately convey what tuned is both for providers and for potential patients, for consumers. Um, partially because, you know, to patients, you were doing a lot of patient education of why hearing healthcare matters. And then for the providers, it's just a very different approach. So really making it crystal clear that this is just it's it's the infrastructure, it's a skeleton to allow you to do whatever you want. It frees up your time. Um, but ultimately it, it's it's been, and maybe people are a little uh, paranoid. It's, it's not the we best. We call that audiology it. PTSD. <laughs> yeah. It's um, you know, they 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 expect there to be these weird caveats or whatever, but really, like Laura was saying, the the whether it's the intentional purpose of tuned or not, um, you can't ignore the fact that it is very pro audiology and it is doing a tremendous amount of work to promote the value of hearing healthcare. Um, and it's doing so by keeping the audiologist like paramount. It's all about the audiologist and their expertise. Yes, maybe it's trickling down to devices, but that's not really the goal. Um, and it's been it's been tricky, uh, to be honest, to to really. Uh, make sure that that message is coming across both to patients and to providers. So the marketing has been interesting. Um, I think there is a lot of potential and innovation that's happening behind the scenes with audiologists. And I, I think we're going to sort of create this pretty amazing blueprint of how you can launch a fully virtual practice, minimal overhead, you know, and, and really just make it about you and your expertise um, and that's going to be so powerful for audiology to have moving forward. I agree. I feel we're kind of like in this period of almost an industrial revolution in audiology, like things are really getting shaken up and uh, we're going to see what happens and what gets created down the road. Like when we're, when we're retired and we're sitting back and we see all the youngins like taking over this blueprint and how amazing it's going to be in the future. I, I think there's a lot of doom and gloom 
about audiology, but then when I speak with audiologists, a lot of them are secretly really excited, but they're afraid to say it, <laughs> you know, cause it's like maybe not the cool thing right now to talk about modern types of care or alternative amplification or whatever. Um, but I think our field is, is blossoming in this way. And, and, and I'm really pleased that we are all helping, you know, move this forward in an ethical evidence-based way. And thank you guys so much for spending time, you know, to peek behind the curtain. Um, if anyone is interested in talking to us to give an opinion or to say, Hey, I didn't like what you guys said about whatever. We're very happy to field everything because that's how we learn. And that's how our field moves forward. So our email addresses are our first names. I'm Heather. We have Kathleen and Laura. It's just first name at tunedcare.com. And if you want to take a peek at what we're doing, um, go to tunedcare.com. You can sign up as an audiologist or just poke around the website. It's free to join, uh, but please talk to us. And again, thank you guys so much.